Dickinson College, student population 2,345. That's 2,345 mouths to feed approximately three times a day for around eight to nine months every year. In 2017, Dickinson spent over $3 million on food and beverages. Almost half of that $3 million went to purchasing meat and other animal products. As an environmental studies major, I'm well aware of the strains industrial animal agriculture places on the planet. Conservative estimates suggest that 15 to 18 percent of greenhouse gases emitted every year originate in the raising of livestock, while the most comprehensive assessments say more than 50 percent of global annual emissions are related to animal agriculture. Untreated animal waste, such as manure and urine, threaten bodies of water, and nearly half of the United States' water resources are consumed by raising animals for food. Food grown to feed cattle, pigs, poultry, and other farmed animals now takes up 30% of the planet's landmass. It's clear to me that the ways in which the majority of meat, dairy, and eggs are produced should concern anyone that cares about humanity's use of natural resources and future generations. But what about industrial animal agriculture's effects on the farmed animals themselves? I wanted to find out more about the source of Dickinson's meat, eggs, and dairy. How do the animals that end up on a Dickinson College student's plate live? Where are they raised? What are the supplier's animal welfare policies? How are they killed and at what age? But as it turned out, finding this information was a lot more difficult than you might think. First, I looked at some numbers. In 2017, around 2,962 students, faculty, and staff used Dickinson's dining services. In total, they ate around 125,000 pounds of chicken, 134,000 pounds of beef and mutton, and 141,000 pounds of pork. That's 400,000 pounds of meat, or 200 tons. And that's not even counting seafood, like fish and crabs, or eggs and dairy products like cheese, milk, yogurt, cream, and butter. That means the average Dickinsonian eats 43 pounds of chicken, 45 pounds of beef and mutton, and 47 pounds of pork annually, or around 135 pounds of meat a year. Again, if seafood, eggs, and dairy were added, that average would be even higher. To track down where some of the dining hall's animal products originated, I started my search with Errol Huffman, Dickinson Dining Services Director. He connected me with Jay Myers, Dickinson's representative from Feeser's Distribution, which is a full-line food service distributor based in the Harrisburg-Hershey area. Through emails with both Huffman and Myers, I first set my sights on learning more about Martin's Quality Eggs in Lancaster County, which provide fresh chicken eggs to the college's cafeteria. Martin's is only a delivery service for their egg suppliers, so I wanted to find a way to visit the source of their product, which could have come from one of the many egg farmers in the area. Myers also told me that poultry and meat cuts that end up at Dickinson often are processed at a facility outside of Philadelphia, Espositos, and a poultry house in Baltimore, Holly Poultry. Myers introduced me to Bill Wiley, who works in Holly Poultry's food service sales. Wiley explained to me that there was essentially no way to track where a specific piece of chicken came from. Much of the chicken that ends up at Holly Poultry comes from farmers contracting with companies such as Tyson and Purdue, but there's no way to identify a farm that definitely sends its end product to Dickinson. Although I was welcome to tour Martin's Quality Eggs Sorting House and Holly Poultry's Cutting Plant, no egg laying or broiler chicken farmer that I reached out to would agree to show me their farm or interview for this video. Some cited concerns over spreading disease to their flocks if I visited, while others were wary of being shown in a bad light. In the end, I had to switch my focus in this video. But the fact that it was so hard for me to see where the animals that become food at my campus are raised is not a surprise, considering that keeping animal agriculture's ugly side away from the public eye is an essential component of cognitive dissonance. What is cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance is the state of having inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioral decisions and attitude change. In the case of animal lovers who eat meat, the cognitive dissonance they experience is also referred to as the meat paradox, in which different animals are categorized as pets, wild animals, or farmed animals. 
Dr. Melanie Joy, a social psychologist and animal advocate, created the term carnism, which refers to a belief system of people who choose to consume meat. Carnists regard eating animals as normal, natural, and necessary by categorizing certain animals as food objects and abstracting their reasoning or emotional capabilities. Many people do not make the connection between what is on their plates and the animal it came from. If it is wrong to act violently to a dog or cat just for enjoyment or convenience, how can we justify the horrible things we do to other animals? We do not need to eat meat or even other animal products, but we do so because we enjoy the taste. And make no mistake, the violence done to farmed animals includes much more than their early death. Although I wasn't able to find out how the specific chicken or cow that became a chicken breast or burger in the cafeteria lived and died, it's safe to look at U.S. industry standards for an idea on what their life and death probably looked like. We treat and use different animals differently, sometimes in ways that cause extreme suffering to billions of individuals. Why does this matter, and how does it connect to Dickinson students? Along with the environmental consequences of animal agriculture, thinking about the meat paradox, and in particular, factory farming's worst aspects, during the semester's environmental studies senior seminar has illuminated a key idea to me. If we want to create and be a part of a more equal, just, and sustainable world, we need to feel more of a sense of community and empathy. We cannot build a society that values nature and incorporates marginalized people if we don't see ourselves in others, if we can't imagine being in the place of a low-income community, facing unchecked climate change, a refugee fleeing war, or an intelligent and sentient creature brutally confined and abused. Our mistreatment of farmed animals is both a symptom and a cause of our disconnect to other humans, non-human animals, and the wider natural world.